Welcome to the Let's Get Entrepreneurial podcast, your go-to resource for navigating the world of entrepreneurship. In this episode, we explore the landscape of entrepreneurship in Ireland with our distinguished guest, Professor Thomas Cooney from the Dublin Institute of Technology. Drawing from his vast experience as an educator, policy advisor, and researcher, Professor Cooney shares invaluable insights and advice to inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. Our podcast addresses tools and concepts that are useful for the launch and growth of entrepreneurial ventures. Your two hosts will be Professor Gary Palin and serial entrepreneur Ryan Budden. Today we have a guest I'm very proud to introduce. We have Professor Tom Cooney. Professor Cooney is an eminent scholar in the European sector in both entrepreneurship and as an academic scholar, and I would argue globally recognized. We're extremely pleased to have Professor Cooney join us. And in addition to those accolades, I also consider him a friend, which I think is the most important part. Gary, it's great to be with you again. And yeah, we've had some good times, both professionally and on a personal basis over the years. And Ryan, delighted to connect with you and meet with you for the first time. Look forward to discussing the topics that lie ahead. Absolutely. Tom, let's start off, if you don't mind, just giving a brief description of your background. I come from a small town in Ireland and would never have been one of the brightest students. And through hard work, got my equivalent of high school qualifications and went down to university. And after university, times were tough in Ireland. It was difficult to get jobs at the time. And so I emigrated to London. I was there for seven years. One of the things that that gave me was an appreciation of the bigger world, an appreciation of what it's like to be an immigrant, also living in a multicultural society, what that meant and the benefits that it brings. And obviously, I was also able to see firsthand the challenges that arise in living in multicultural societies. So while I was there, I did my master's in business administration at the University of Bradford in Northern England really enjoyed my time there and then in 1991 got the job that I'm still in 30 odd years later. Along the way I did my PhD in Trinity College uh, Dublin which would be highly prestigious university and it was in 2006 I set up the Institute for Minority Entrepreneurship here in my own university and that's become the focus of my work I suppose for the last 16, 17 years. It's been a wonderful journey. And I'll tell you what, Ari, is that where I'm extraordinarily lucky is I love my job. I love going to work. I love the people I work with. And working with entrepreneurs and working with young people, uh, both highly exciting, both highly frustrating, and a hell of a lot of fun along the way. Excellent. Well, I believe it was around that 2006 time frame that we met. So that in the entire journey, I've been following your activity and your careers and your multiple successes. What specifically spurred you to become interested in entrepreneurship and to specifically focus on being an entrepreneurship professor in Ireland? It began actually in my undergraduate degree, which happened in the early 80s at University College Cork. And for the first time ever, they put on an elective called New Venture Creation. Took it out of kind of curiosity. It really stimulated my mind. And I just got curious about small business. And it wasn't something that was widely spoken about at the time. Certainly entrepreneurship was not a hot topic back in 1980s Ireland. At the time, we were going through significant problems with the closure of multinational companies in Cork City, Ford and Dunlop and a couple of other really big multinationals closed and there was high unemployment. So entrepreneurship was not a topic that would have been widely discussed, but it really piqued my interest. And then when I did my MBA in Bradford, they also had a new venture creation module. And I took it this time because I really wanted to take it. And I just loved it. It just excited me as a topic. So when I began teaching, there was no entrepreneurship modules being taught in the university at that time. And I put my hand up and said, look, I'd like to do a module with an undergrad class. 
can I have permission to try something out? And they said, yeah, go for it. From one small module, we now have masters in entrepreneurship and we have entrepreneurship modules running across different faculties and we do a lot of external work. It became, instead of one part of my teaching, it became my whole career. It's something where I believe I can make a contribution, but also those who I work with can make a contribution to your know, broader society. What really interests me is the way that this topic has changed over the years from the notion of entrepreneurship equaling only new venture creation to where we're now much more talking about it as entrepreneurial mindset or entrepreneurial behavior that's possible in many different facets of our lives. It's interesting that you do mention that because I've seen that same transition from originally people were thinking the old small business model and teach people how to start small business and how it has morphed to an entrepreneurial mindset. You're correct. It wasn't accepted in the early days. I remember the first time I mentioned the word entrepreneurship with a course attached to it at NC State, the university faculty beat the heck out of me. In Ireland in the 70s and 80s, to be an entrepreneur, there was kind of a saying that, you know, if you succeeded, you were you know, a chancer. And if you failed, you were a gangster. You were doing something wrong, whatever way, right? And you certainly couldn't succeed as an entrepreneur unless you were on the edge of the law some way. And so it wasn't seen as a career that you should be encouraging people into. We'll get into it possibly later, but that's one of the things that's changed quite dramatically in Ireland since the 1980s, where it's now much more celebrated and encouraged. What's really important about the entrepreneurial mindset is that, you know, not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, but the benefits of having an entrepreneurial mindset and a, an entrepreneurial kind of sense of behavior means that whatever your career, whatever your job, whatever your role, whether it's in a large organization or social enterprise, you know, you can bring those positive attitudes and opportunity recognition and gathering resources and all of that to your organization, to your job, and even bring it to your local community in terms of volunteer work or if you're the chairperson of the local tennis club or social club, you can be highly entrepreneurial within the context of those organizations and bring value to them also. It's about bringing added value to whatever job you do in whatever organization you work with. And that's why it's so exciting. I agree 100%. We talk a lot about the concept of entrepreneurship, not necessarily using entrepreneurship as a business model, but using that mindset no matter what you're doing. That's a key takeaway from any of these discussions. And Ryan, what I find interesting, right, is that I do some work with small companies consultancy work and mentoring work and they'd be giving out about employees and about they're lazy or they're not doing this or they're not doing that and these very same people walk out the gate at five o'clock and become highly proactive volunteers with their local sports and social clubs or they're running local sports or social club right and I'm saying to the boss how come that same person you're giving out about is highly entrepreneurial as soon as they walk out the gate so the problem isn't with the person, right? It's the problem is, what are you doing that's not getting the best out of them while they're here with you? So should we be looking at the environment within this organization? Should we be looking at you and your performance rather than giving out about the employee themselves? That whole discussion is really interesting. My current research, Tom, is in the field of entrepreneurial cultures within companies. And Ryan and I are doing some work on doing assessments of companies' entrepreneurial culture and looking to assist them with the disconnects. So address exactly what you're talking about. And Ryan is a successful entrepreneur. I'm sure you know, you've had this conversation before in terms of getting the best out of your people in a way that they're maximizing their talents while they're with you, not while they're outside. Yeah, maximizing their talents and maximizing their enjoyment. Where is their zone of genius is really the term I like to apply to it. Where are they particularly skillful? And how do you harness that? 
Tom, we've talked a little bit about entrepreneurship in the beginning and how it wasn't accepted and then entrepreneurship in the academic environment. What does it look like in Ireland overall right now? How has that culture built? It, it has changed quite dramatically, uh, positively, obviously, because it was in a very poor place, so it couldn't have gone down much worse. The big change is that the entrepreneur is now celebrated much more not necessarily a hero but as somebody who brings value to society as someone who brings value to the economy of the country and there's no tv programs capturing awards nights there's newspaper articles talking about entrepreneurs there's the whole culture and support ecosystem is much more geared towards supporting people in terms of startup activity and our rate of startup would be in Western Europe would be on the better side of startup activity. And then in terms of our ecosystem, like World Bank reports and other similar international reports have all highlighted that for doing business and for starting a business, Ireland tends to be in the top 10, if not top 20 in the world in terms of a place to do business. If you say you're going to start up your own business these days, it's a completely different attitude than what you would have got 40 years ago. Where we're still struggling, Ryan, is that we still suffer a bit on the stigma of failure. So if somebody, if their business fails, they tend to get tarnished with that still. It's not seen in the American sense of where, you know, it's part of your apprenticeship. I had a really interesting conversation with a woman last year who was telling me she was a serial entrepreneur in Ireland, hugely successful, and was trying to get something off the ground in New York and couldn't get funding. And one of the reasons that was being given was that she had no failure behind her. So she didn't understand, you know, what it was to hurt and the lessons learned from that. <laughs> like. We were laughing, right? Because in Ireland, just a perfect record, right? So another simple example was a guy telling me a story that he was out in San Francisco and he was invited to a cocktail party and his business had just failed, right? And he was a bit reticent about going. And anyway, he's at the cocktail party and somebody said, well, so what are you doing with yourself? And quite shyly, he said, well, actually, my business just failed. And he said, the next question just really blew him away because the next question was, so what's your next startup idea? He said, if I was at home in Ireland, he said, first of all, I probably wouldn't have been invited to the cocktail party. And he said, and certainly he said, the conversation would have been around, okay, where are you going to get a job? Nobody would have said to him, what's your next startup idea? And so that's one of the big cultural differences between US and Ireland. Failure is allowed. Failure is part of the learning journey in America, whereas for us, it really sets you back. And a lot of people feel really badly about it and kind of suffer the stigma of kind of shame. That's something in the culture that we still need to work on and we still need to change. That's an interesting area, Tom. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most common distinction as I travel across the globe is seeing the perspective of failure versus the United States. Unfortunately, though, I believe we are losing some of that perspective of failure with the trophy generation and not allowing our young people to fail. And I believe we're crippling them. As I've often said, if you're not allowed to fail, then you won't take risk. Right? Or you certainly look for ways to minimize risk. I've often also said that a problem I have with culture, not just in Ireland, no, but this would be more international is policymakers are not allowed to fail. So if policymakers introduce legislation or if they introduce some initiative that doesn't work out, it's all over the media. They're getting panned on the media. They're getting panned on social media. Voters are kicking them out of office because of something stupid they did, right? Are policymakers expected to get it right 100% of the time? Because if they are, then they're not going to take any risk, right? So you get, you finish up with low risk takers Okay, and then we're giving out because they won't take risk. We've got to accept 
risk, as part of pushing boundaries, as part of innovation, as part of change that's needed in today's world, right? Because things ain't working like they need to be, and we need to find innovative solutions, and that'll only happen through risk taking. I agree. Tom, another area of entrepreneurship in the United States, there are many resources and support systems for nascent entrepreneurs. Any city of any decent size probably has an entrepreneurship center. There are networking events where someone who's never been in the field can go to these events and centers and meet people that are established in this very sharing environment where the successful entrepreneurs will be helping those coming along with them. Are there any type of support systems in Ireland where nascent entrepreneurs can step into? Falling over ourselves with support agencies, Gary, falling over ourselves with support agencies. And actually, one of the problems we have is that there are that many that try to understand who's doing what, where, and who exactly is available, who's the best person to help me, can be problematic. And... Also, there would be some bit of a kind of postcode lottery to the support mechanisms that might be available to you. There is an enterprise office in every county in the country, in the, in the major cities, obviously. There's a vast array of supports and support initiatives uh, available. Where there's room for improvement, the supports are very generic. There are a few tailored supports for minority or disadvantaged communities. So the perception would be that we treat everyone the same. Our door is open to everyone. If you're someone with a disability, if you're an immigrant, if you are you know, a senior, right, then your needs are exactly the same as everybody else's. And therefore, come to our office, we'll help you, and we'll treat you the same as everyone. But the reality is that People from minority and disadvantaged backgrounds have additional and distinctive challenges that are not recognized or appreciated by policymakers or enterprise support agencies. They need tailored support in terms of pre startup and early startup activity. Now, my own view is that once they're up and running, let's mainstream them as soon as possible. But we have to recognize the additional and distinctive challenges. And that can only be done by customized or tailored support. For example, in 2021, I introduced an online entrepreneurship course for people with disability. And that was the first tailored program for people with disability regarding entrepreneurship in Ireland. Right. So that's 2021. Right. So we need to do more work in that space. We need to do more work in terms of tailoring the supports around the specific challenges that people from different communities might face. We'll get there. We'll get there. You know, there's been OECD reports which have highlighted the benefits of minority entrepreneurship or inclusive entrepreneurship, as others would term it, particularly with immigrants, the value of international trading between their home country and their host country. So there's so much benefit there, right? And there's so much potential amongst these communities that we need to tap into much more. And that's where I'd like to see more of the effort being made. That's interesting. And it would be looking at it from a startup perspective. A startup that's trying to sell everyone the same solution very often fails. So what you have recommended is, in this case, is going to what you would recommend to a business is pick a specific niche and serve that niche. That makes perfect sense. I'm curious on these support agencies, are they government driven or are they driven by entrepreneurs? Almost exclusively government or public sector type agencies. There would be some social enterprises, but very little would be available through an entrepreneur setting up something for the benefit of others. Now you do get a lot of philanthropy, but they'll be resourcing it into like a social enterprise, or you will get entrepreneurs who very gladly and you know give back uh, in different ways. So, for example, with the course that I deliver on for people with disability, we have guest speakers each week who will be entrepreneurs with a disability, and like no problem in supporting us and wouldn't look for a fee or anything. 
there's a lot of giving back by entrepreneurs, a lot of giving in terms of money, but it's true agencies that would either be public sector or social enterprise type activity. You wouldn't have a private center like, like Kaufman or something like that set up where money would be pumped into it to make things happen through the riches of an individual or an organization. Tom, I love hearing your passion about supporting these maybe fringe entrepreneurs that have a disadvantage or from a different background. It really comes through when you're talking about it. Cheers, Ryan. I suppose where I come from it is that back in the mid noughties, we were going through what was referred to as the Celtic Tiger. Our economy was absolutely booming and the money was flowing in. And I noticed that we had these different communities who weren't getting anywhere near the same benefit. And I wanted to kind of change that. And when I looked at how I could make change happen, not make change happen, but I'd be too ambitious to be more around how could I contribute to enabling them to maximize their economic and social potential. My skill set was entrepreneurship education. If I could do something to encourage people from those communities to start up their own business, that brings benefit to all of us. You, know, you get a lot of negative talk around oh, immigrants are taking our jobs and all this kind of nonsense. Well, let's help them start up their own job. And the one I suppose that I'm most passionate about is people with disabilities, because 12.5% of the population, 13.5% of the population self-identify as having a disability. The rate of employment and the rate of pay is shameful. And that's not just Ireland, no. Like you can pick any country on that one. And yet the conversation around self-employment never gets discussed. It's all about, oh, how can we get them a job? And you're going, well, hang on a sec, you know, these people are, you know, this is a community that's got plenty of talent, right? And if we look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, well, arguably. There's a number of them with neurodivergent type characteristics, right? And technically would fall under the disability label or category. But why are we being so dismissive all of a sudden? So I just think there's huge potential there. Another interesting one, Ryan, that I'm working on at the moment is I'm developing a program in conjunction with others on a EU funded program on developing entrepreneurship programs for prisoners. I've delivered training previously inside prison. They come out of prison, nobody will give them a job because of the prison record. So the other options are welfare or going back to what you were doing that generated income for you the last time out, right? Which was crime. And I'm saying, why don't we go for another option, which is self-employment? And as I said to the participants on the program, when I first delivered it some years ago, my opening line was, well, you've already demonstrated one key characteristic of entrepreneurship, a willingness to take risk. In there somewhere, there's entrepreneurial capacity. We just need to get it on the right side of the law. I love that. <laughs> so an another key insight, I really like what you've talked about, is the perspective of failure and how that's really embedded in the culture in Ireland. Are, are there any other cultural facets like that that you think have shifted over your years participating in the entrepreneurship community or anything that's unique to Ireland? Yeah, one of the big ones is what I would term kind of uh, island mentality. We're a small island of the island of Great Britain, which is off Europe, right? We're not very good at languages. We speak English, right? And therefore we, we're lazy. We don't feel the need to learn other languages and communicate with the world in their languages. That obviously has a kickback on exports, right? And then we had a trade policy in Ireland for the first 50 years of our existence. If we take our existence beginning in 1922, when we became independent from Great Britain, like for the first 50 years, like our trade policy was about being self-sustaining. And so we didn't encourage imports and we didn't do a whole lot of exports except our people. That was the only thing we exported in large numbers. 
so that's changed quite dramatically, where we now are much more driven towards international business activity. Obviously, given our location, internationally traded services works much better for us. The other thing that we've done extraordinarily well is that we've been extraordinarily good at attracting foreign multinational companies into Ireland. We've done a really good job on that with good reason, right? People talk about it's all due to corporation tax. Yeah, that's part of it, but it's not the only reason. We've got a really well-educated workforce, about 60% of the current under 30s would have university education, right? So we're well-educated. We're in the European Union, which Britain is not. We've got a young population we're increasingly looking outwards. We've got a stable economy. We've got a stable government. People enjoy life in Ireland. There's a lot of reason why it makes sense to be here. Because of that, you get a lot of startup activity in kind of satelliting around those big multinational organizations like Facebook and LinkedIn and all the other big ones. They have their European and Middle East headquarters here in Ireland. Tom, another area that I'd like to discuss, in the United States, we can't turn around without bumping into some type of government regulatory policy or initiative. Some of them are helpful to business startup. Many of them are prohibitive and get in our way. How has your government in Ireland been to, in the areas of regulatory policies to either assist or negatively impact startups? Ireland will be hugely pro-business and pro-entrepreneurship. So they do work hard at minimizing red tape. That doesn't mean that there still exists a whole lot of it, right? But look, in terms of the World Bank report, most recent one, we were top 10 in terms of ease of doing business. Recognition by government around the role of business in the economy, I think has just driven that agenda to ensure that legislation is supporting rather than hindering business. We also have very good, what I call kind of social partnerships, and that's where government industry bodies and trade unions will come together and kind of work together in terms of what works best for the country in designing economic policy and in terms of also rewarding workers with regard to their contribution to the growth in the economy. So we've had a history of, you know, that that history arose due to going through bad times. And it was like, okay, how do we get ourselves out of this? This can only happen if we work together. But look, they did work together. It did happen. Yeah, there's that tradition of, yeah, I suppose common goal towards legislation and ease of burden with regard to business activity. Is there a distinction between the federal government regulatory systems in support versus local? No, not really, because Ireland would be too small a country. There is local government. There is local government legislation and bylaws. It's not like the U.S. system where, say, in Maine, you would have a series of laws and regulations and business legislation, and then you'd have the U.S. government. So, you know, legislation on top of that. We would just have the state law. And remember, we're just 5 million people on a small island. The one super layer is more than enough to cover us. You've obviously had a long career in entrepreneurship and specifically around education. So this might be a difficult question, but if you had to boil all of that experience down to a couple key lessons, does anything stand out to you? Oh, great question, Ryan. Great question. For me, I believe passionately that entrepreneurship education should be about engendering mindsets and behavior rather than new venture creation. I keep saying this to students who come into my class. I don't have a magic wand. I'm not going to wave some wand and you're going to become an entrepreneur. And that's not my ambition. I began every module with a quote from, I put it up on a slide, a quote from the Greek philosopher Plutarch, 
who once wrote, minds are not vessels to be filled, but fires to be ignited. That's my philosophy to entrepreneurship education. I'm not filling vessels, okay? I'm trying to light a fire. And that fire may not burn very brightly immediately, but if it stays lit, then somewhere along the line, that could turn into a flame. And if that flame, right, become, whether that's in starting a business or doing something of value to the community or doing something of value in their own or in a large organization, or as I say to the students, I'm in public sector and I believe I'm entrepreneurial. I like to push boundaries. I like to take risk. And, and here I am in the public sector, right, which is meant to be low risk taking environments. And it's also a great way to live life. Instead of filling vessels, just lighting fires. And you try to kind of encourage students that life is there to be lived, make the most of it. You got to take risks. You got to make mistakes. And at the end of your days, you're lying on your deathbed going, wow, that was a hell of a life. I lived it, right? One of the things I'm totally against is the notion of a student coming in, spending time, passing some assignments, getting their credits and moving on. If that's your idea of education, please go to some other classroom, okay? I don't want you here with me. When you give young people that environment, a positive environment, a supportive environment, they respond accordingly and they do really exciting stuff. So that's what education should be about. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is I passionately believe in the notion that entrepreneurship is available to all communities. No, I've never once argued it's the panacea for unemployment for all ex-offenders or all people with disability, right? But we certainly need to put it into the conversation in all of these communities and offer it as you know, an alternative career option because there's huge potential in there. So those would be the two big lessons, right? I love it. I really can hear the passion behind that. And I hope our listeners can as well. And it's clear you've made a big impact in those areas in your university and in Ireland. Cheers, Ryan. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have so many commonalities in our thoughts on our approaching entrepreneurship education, Tom. I'm with you 100%. And I think the Kaufman Foundation several years ago did a study of students that majored in entrepreneurship. Upon graduation, only 1% of them started a business. So if the goal was to teach them how to start a business and we have 1%, that means we suck. But that is not the goal. The goal is to help develop their mindset. And very often we're making them more valuable to other organizations as employees or workers within those. Well, here's an interesting finding. In Denmark, the Foundation for Young Enterprise has been doing longitudinal studies on primary school students who take entrepreneurship. And what they found is that the students attend school more often, perform better across a range of subjects, interact better with their peers, interact better with their teachers, and a number of other kind of benefits as well, right? And I keep saying this here in Ireland, right? We should not be selling entrepreneurship education in primary school as a capitalist type activity. Because that's what teachers see. That's what they think about. Okay, oh, the only reason they're doing entrepreneurship is how to make money. No, if we can sell it as, if you teach entrepreneurship, I've always said this to primary school teachers, it shouldn't be about, let's do entrepreneurship now. You could have a maths question around, there was a business person who had two shops and build a maths question around business situation or in a reading in English talk about an entrepreneur sell to them the notion that students who take these activities are more likely to attend class are more likely to behave better in class are more likely to interact better with their peers now what educationalist wouldn't want to have those kind of results so we're selling the wrong message we need to be selling the broader personal and social benefits rather than this notion of entrepreneurship makes people rich. I've never met anyone that had a goal of becoming wealthy, starting a business and achieving the goal. 
because it's too damn hard. They give up before they achieve it. And I tell my students, if you're coming here with the sole focus of becoming wealthy, leave, go study finance and go to Wall Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a tough career. It's a tough career. And also we look at the areas of social entrepreneurship, which both you and I are interested in. And the focus on that is making a social impact using entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if we're thinking entrepreneurially, if we're behaving entrepreneurially, that can be for the benefit of all. Most of the truly successful entrepreneurs that I interact with, the problem is their passion. What are they trying to solve? What's the issue that their business is fixing? And the money is a byproduct of that. It really interests you to say that, right? Because a really good friend of mine who's hugely successful, all that money does for him, it's a way of keeping score. It's a way of kind of recognizing how well he's doing. But in terms of the add-on money that he's making, he doesn't care whether there's an extra million in the bank or not. He's got more than enough, right? But if he puts in, you know, X amount extra this year, it means that, okay, I've done really well this year, right? I've driven myself harder. I've exceeded my own expectations. It's his way of keeping score rather than, you know, the money becomes irrelevant. Tom, the last question we have for you before we wrap up is how do you envision the future of entrepreneurship in Ireland and what role do you hope to play in it? My role is I want to be a pain in the butt to policymakers, right? Because I want to continue advocating for minority communities. I still believe that we are missing significant untapped potential and that is where the area for greatest opportunity lies in terms of entrepreneurial activity in Ireland. I kind of think we've kind of close to maxed out on entrepreneurship activity from a mainstream population. We're continuing to kind of keep the numbers going at a kind of a decent rate. I think if we want to lift it to the next level, we need to start looking into these communities that are just huge resource and huge potential in many different ways. But also what it does, obviously, is that it would help society in terms of greater integration. One of the challenges I find with immigrant entrepreneurs is they're setting up businesses that are targeting only their own communities, which doesn't make good business sense because frequently the size of their own community isn't big enough to sustain the business. You know, and we keep challenging them to make the business more visible to the mainstream population. That's good for business, but it's also good for social interaction and social integration. That's where I think the potential is, and that's where you'll find me at the cold face. Before we close out, are there any other final thoughts or insights you'd like to share with our audience, Tom? The thing I would encourage people to do is, it doesn't have to be a university student or can be anyone in any stage of their life, right, is take an entrepreneurship course. Look at it from the notion of being entrepreneurial or continue listening to YouTube guys and learn from the podcast, right? Look at how entrepreneurial thinking and behavior can enrich your life and enrich the life of those around you. It's not just for university students. It's for anyone who wants to grow as a person and grow a career. And I just would recommend people check it out. I would agree. And I would add, be a proactive learner. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What a note to end on. I love it. <laughs> well, can I just say thank you? Because I've really enjoyed the conversation and may I wish both of you well with the podcast and continuing to engage with so many people from so many countries and I can understand why and you've got a new subscriber now right because I'll be signing up after this because I really enjoyed the conversation guys so thank you so much for the invitation. Well, thank you very much Tom and it's been way too long that we've gotten together to tip a Guinness together and the next time we set that up we'll even invite Ryan because someone has to pick up the tab for the first round. <laughs> hey if that's how I have to buy myself in yeah, Gary, I thought you were going to say someone's got to drive us home. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> That's what Ubers are for, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Ryan, a pleasure meeting with you. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Yeah. Hope to meet in person one day. Gary, as always, great to see you, mate. Thanks for listening to our podcast. As always, you can head over to profspirit.com to check out more resources and courses designed for you, the entrepreneur. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and others to get the most up-to-date information as it is released.